That was her freshman year, the first game they went to. I thought they went to their games. I know. And then even the same thing there, Ohio State gear, head to toe. That looks young. Yeah, it's definitely aged us all significantly. She and I would go to a mission situation with our church where we would go down and serve meals. I can just remember her being so compassionate and she was very thankful and happy to be able to be a part of doing something to put a bright spot in their day. When she was very excited about something, she would have the biggest, brightest smile and um, she loved the fact that she could light up a room just by smiling and being excited and kind to people and it would really shift the tone of anywhere that she was at. On February 9th, 2017, it was a cold, miserable, snowy day in Grove City, Ohio, when we got the call that a body was discovered in the side of Grove Metro Park. Hello? Hello, 911. Yeah, I think there's a body out here. Please send somebody, hurry. Okay. I heard that there had been a body found. I knew there was a missing student, and I just told my boss, hey, I'm going. What happened to Reagan, I think, is every woman's nightmare, every parent's, every friend's nightmare. You're just trying to live your life and get from point A to point B safely, and it's interrupted by something violent and senseless. Her last words were was, I just want to live, and that's really all she wanted. Some days it feels like a lifetime, and some days it feels like just yesterday. I'm gonna wake up and it's all been a nightmare and it's not real, but it is. the picture that we used that you put on her chair for the wedding. Yeah, why'd you pick this one? Because it's pretty and it captures that light about her and, and all around her halo, you know? It's just so illuminating. Regan came into this world like a burst of energy. The shining bright light that she was, she was born at 1.08 a.m. Why did she let everybody know that she was there? And she was just this wide awake and hi, everybody, here I am. And that's really who and how she was always. Growing up in Ohio was in a really small community and everybody was very tight knit. We knew everybody on the street. Some kids grew up and became our babysitters and we hosted all holidays my entire childhood being Thanksgiving and Christmas, and everybody was welcome at our house. Reagan and her father loved a lot of the same things. Football, for example, loved football, loved Ohio State, um, and that was her and Toby's thing. And I can remember a time that Toby took her to a football game at Ohio State when she was like four or five and she had her little Ohio State cheerleader outfit and everything on and she had said at that game that she was going to go to school there and sure enough she did. There was a career opportunity for Toby that came about around holiday time of Reagan's senior year. We had made the decision as a family that she was going to be going off to college. Mackenzie was willing and open to move with us to this opportunity in Florida. And we moved that summer and then she got settled at Ohio State. The last special time that I had seen her was the last time we went and visited her in Ohio. 
this was the first time that I got to go and really like sleep over at her apartment. She was very protective over me. And when Reagan was in the shower, her roommate came to me and said, do you want to go get some food with us? I thought it was the coolest thing that I got to be invited to go out and do something with these older girls. And Reagan called one of them and was like, what have you done with my little sister? Like, is she in the car with you right now? And she was so not happy that they took me out of the house without telling her. The next morning, our parents came over and they had just a really big tailgate and that was I think for all of us, a really core memory that we all have was getting to go to this game. It was her last game as a student. I think if, if Toby and I had to quantify something that we're really proud of, it was bringing our two daughters into this world and the way our family unit and network was. Um, very positive, very loving, very happy home. Reagan's future was very bright. She had just gotten her first real job outside of college uh, in Cleveland. She was about to move there. She was going to utilize her degree in psychology and essentially try to help people because she cared so much about them. Reagan consistently would always talk to my dad to check in with him every day and let him know that she made it home safe. Her and I had had a conversation that day, 3.45, I'll never forget, because I was in a Walmart. And I was talking on the phone and pushing the cart at the same time. And I had crashed it into a display of bananas while I was on the phone with her. And she was laughing at me, and she was like, seriously, Mom? But her and I had had a very fun, bantery conversation that day. Reagan was going to work that night, and it was a new job. And we weren't super thrilled about it. The fact that this job was keeping her out in the evenings, she was excited about it because she was looking for additional ways to earn some money. On the 8th, we hadn't heard from her, and it started to get a little suspicious, but on one hand, my dad was growing more and more concerned, and on the other, you had to remind yourself that she was 21 years old, almost 22. She was a full-fledged grown-up at that point. But I knew when we had gone to bed that night, it was just a little off in our house. She had talked to my husband right prior to going into work. But when she didn't text, he was uneasy because he hadn't been able to get a hold of her. And her phone went right to voicemail. The next morning I got up and I was getting ready for school and I went down and had my breakfast like normal and my mom had my lunch sitting out and when I went to leave, they both told me, if you hear from your sister today, let us know immediately. And to me, that was kind of a red flag. As time had started to pro progress, we're, we're getting really uncomfortable. I called her work, and they hadn't heard from her. I was not able to report her as missing because I was not the last person to see her. So they had to call. So we had a uh, employee leave work last night, and she has not been home. Uh, her phone is off. Nobody can find her. She hasn't been home at all either. Her mom's been calling, uh, looking for um, we can't find her car around work. I was getting ready to tweet this photo, and I thought, if I tweet this out, one, that makes this very real, and two, if she ends up being completely fine, there's no way of taking this back. But I tweeted it out, and it instantly started to go off like wildfire, and I had people get my cell phone and start reaching out to me somehow, and news stations and broadcasters and et cetera. The roommates had confirmed that her bed hadn't been slept in. And obviously that was very concerning because she never did anything like that. She always came home. 
And what we didn't know at that point was there was a Jane Doe that had been found. Mackenzie, who was at work, and Toby and I were home, but we were trying to stay off of our phones so that if we got a phone call, Sorry, this is gonna take me a minute. Hello? Hello, 911. Yeah, I think there's a body out here at um, Scioto Grove Metro Park. I don't know if this is a fake or, or what. I can't, I'm afraid to get close to it. Please send somebody, hurry. Okay, so don't get near it. It's bloody, it's got the arm over its face. I can't, I'm afraid to get near it. I can't tell if it's fake or what, man. Can you tell if it's a male or female or anything like that? It's a female. I don't think this person's alive. The information that we got on the call was an individual saw what they believed to be a body laying probably about 50 feet off the road. We immediately dispatched officers out to that area to find out what was going on. Working in the prosecutor's office, we would frequently hear about offenses or homicides that took place. I found out pretty quickly after a body had been found. There was no identifying information. Her purse was gone, no cell phone, anything like that. So the Grove City Police Department had to coordinate locally and see if there were any reports of missing people. We had confirmation from our patrol officers who arrived on the scene and that it was a human being. But there is possibly a body. Oh. It's going to be, he said, possibly a female who is bloody with an arm over the face. I was one of the first investigators to approach the body. And you could see that it was a young female in her 20s. She didn't have any clothes on. She was wearing a necklace. And she had an apparent gun wound um, to the back of her head. Since she didn't have any clothes on, we were looking for identification, purse, or anything along the lines of that. The entrance to the park, there was a few houses out around there. We started to go out there and scour the area and talk to witnesses and see if they heard anything, if they saw anything, and no one, no one had. I was in the newsroom when I heard that there had been a body found at Scioto Grove Metro Park. And I remember at this point, I knew there was a missing student. As a reporter, your main goal is to report true and accurate information. So as much as your mind might want to say, hey, I know there's a missing Ohio State student, I know right now there's a young woman who has been found, you cannot in any way tell people that. Of course it comes to mind, but you can't really assume anything. We started searching databases to try to get an identity on who the victim may be. We got a phone call from some females in the campus area of Ohio State University, along with the short north area of a friend of theirs that matched the description of the victim that was missing and they haven't seen or heard of from her for over 24 hours. We showed the friends the necklace and the tattoo that we had taken photographs of. They looked at both of those and they were able to say, yes, that's a matching tattoo that Reagan had and that's a necklace that she would have been worn. Once we had a pretty good idea that it was Reagan, we still needed to make the 100% identification from a family or a friend of Reagan. So we had to reach out to the family and let them know. I got this phone call and this guy, he asked me if I was by myself or if Toby was with me. And I'm like, no, Toby is here with me. And then he just proceeded to tell me that a body of a young woman had been found that morning in Scioto Grove Metro Park. They were fairly certain that it was rigged. And there is nothing in this world that would ever prepare a parent to get a phone call like that. And I can remember just standing there saying, you have to be mistaken. It can't be. It, that's, you know, it's not her. 
People around Ohio State were rightfully scared. And this could have been any Ohio State student. So people were rightfully upset. People were scared. People were wondering, do we have a killer on the loose? And they did. The day she was found, we did not find out from police on that day that this was Reagan. They told the family, they told friends, but police did not publicly put that out there until the next day. Looking back on it, I mean, a lot of it is a blur. I can remember this information was out there and the media had started to pick up on it. We knew we needed to get to Mackenzie because she had put it out on social media that her sister was missing and was asking for help and all of that. And we did not want her hearing this from anybody but us. And so we got into the car and we drove up to where she worked. And she took one look at Toby and I and immediately knew something was horribly, horribly wrong. I instantly knew what had happened just from the looks of their faces. I knew that she wasn't found alive. She had been found dead. The look on their faces was, it's not like she had been in a car accident and something like that happened. It was complete and utter devastation. I just kept hoping and praying that it was a mistake <laughs> and my brother actually was en route to go to the morgue to identify her because obviously we were in Florida and I just kept praying he was gonna get there and he was gonna call me and say, no, it's, it's not her. But that's not, the, that's not the call that we got. One of the worst things I've ever did as a journalist, as far as the impact it had on me as I went to Reagan's apartment, knocked on the door, her roommates opened the door, just clearly in hysterics. At that point, it was pretty clear that what police hadn't told us yet, this was Reagan who had been found. We didn't have anything until maybe 10, 15 minutes before the 11 o'clock news that we could report um, as fact and know that it was Reagan. We went from looking for her and thinking that she was out there alive or had been in an accident and couldn't get a hold of us or that even maybe she was being held hostage somewhere. I don't think our mind ever went straight to that she was not going to be found alive. So when we did hear that and hear those words, I think we all just went into a state of complete shock. It literally feels like Somebody has sucked all the air out of your lungs and kicked you in the, in the stomach at the same time. It, and we knew at this point that the person they thought was Reagan at that point had been shot. When the police discovered Reagan's body, they were initially unaware of what happened to her, but the autopsy revealed that she had two bullet wounds in the back of her head, one of which was fired at close range. We believe that it was going to be a, a murder investigation because there was no weapon around for this to be self-inflicted. We didn't know if this was going to be a domestic-related issue, if the killer would have known the victim at the time, or exactly what we had on our hands at that particular moment. First 24 hours of a homicide investigation is very important because you need to track down as many leads as you possibly can find and so that we can quickly try to recover any evidence and get the case resolved. There were some aspects of the way that Reagan died and what happened in her last moments that suggest this killer really wanted to demean her in her last moments. She was forced to undress and was found laying naked. This is, of course, very upsetting for the family, but you can imagine for Reagan, she was trying to comply, hoping that it may save her life, but it didn't.
The police, by gathering that surveillance footage from the bodega bar, they were able to determine what time she had last been seen alive. Um, and then kind of work their way from there to see had anybody else seen her, had contact with her within her inner circles or anybody that knew who she was once she walked out of the bar that night. This is a video of Reagan leaving the bar that evening. Uh, it's her saying goodbye to the bartender. And as she walks out the door, we're watching this to see if anyone follows her. She walks down the street over to where she normally parks her car at. Young women are told over and over growing up, be careful when you're walking in parking lots, be careful when you're out alone. And so to have it actually happen to somebody is just unfathomable. They had asked for her cell phone records and then we had talked about her vehicle and we reported it missing and stolen. They eventually were able to find her vehicle and it was through a license plate reader on a trash truck that was driving down the street and it pinged it. One of the biggest leads that they were following up in in that kind of first 24 to 36 hours was her car, which had been located uh, in an area that it should not have been. I can remember one of the questions of them asking me was, did she smoke? My reaction was like, absolutely not. I'm like, no, she did not smoke. I know that for a fact. And then one of the other things that they had called and asked us about was, was there any reason she would have had a gas can in the back of her trunk? And again, in my reaction, I can remember being like, no, she wouldn't have, she wasn't stupid. Like, why would she drive around with a gas can that's dangerous? Once the vehicle was located, an investigator arrived and started looking in through the windows. He was able to see that the, the front seat of the vehicle looked like it had burn marks on it. They noticed two very important things. Number one was a gas can. In the car, it looked like the killer had maybe tried to douse the car in gas and set it on fire, ultimately unsuccessful. That would have been something that might have gotten rid of any kind of DNA or other evidence. The police were also able to locate some cigarette butts, both inside the car and right outside the car. Um, the cigarette butts outside the car looked fresh. They knew that whoever had driven that car, whoever had left that stuff in the car, I believe police would tell you they knew right then that was their key to figuring out who was responsible. So at this point, we're probably 24, 26 hours into the investigation, and we haven't slept. So our sergeant sent us home while the crime lab was trying to extract DNA from the cigarette butt. And within an hour of being home, we got a phone call from our sergeant saying that the lab made a positive identification on the cigarette butt that was inside the vehicle. I immediately recognized the suspect as Brian Goolsby. He was an individual that we prosecuted a few years ago prior to this incident for rape and kidnapping as well. Reagan Tokes didn't know Brian Goldsby at all. They had never crossed paths. They had never interacted. Uh, he was a complete and total stranger to her. Once we had Brian identified as a person of interest, we issued an arrest warrant. The officer showed up. They identified Brian and immediately brought him to the Grove City Police Department to be interviewed. When we found out he was arrested, I think there's a big sense of relief that someone got caught. And then it's almost immediately like, why? Like, why would someone do this to an innocent girl? There was no connection between the two. You'll be able to talk to the detective desk in here soon enough. 
Brian Goldsby was not a Grove City local, and he was not known to Grove City Police, but he was certainly known to the Columbus Police Department, um, as well as um, the Ohio prison system. Brian Goldsby had been released from prison not too long before this offense. He had committed a very similar offense against another woman where he had sexually assaulted her, uh, held her against her will. But in that instance, he let her live. He let her get away. She reported it, and he ended up going to prison for several years. There was a woman that he held at knife point and raped in front of her child, a plea deal was given to him, and he had reduced sentencing time that he shouldn't have had. And had this ridiculous situation not happened with his prior sentencing, he would never have been on the street that night and should have never crossed paths with my daughter, and she would still be here with us. Knowing that he only did six years in prison for his previous crimes was very disheartening, very disappointing to not only me, but the other investigators or officers that had worked on that case. He was staying kind of, I believe we refer to them as halfway houses for people who had been out of jail, but still were kind of working their way back into normal society. And that's where he had been staying at the time. And they found Reagan's car nearby them. So he was still fresh out of jail. Detective Deskins will be in here, and I don't know if he's got an offer one or not, to be honest with you. I don't have any on me. Once Brian was arrested and being brought back to the police department, I knew that I, we had to formulate a plan. I knew that I had to have someone else in the room with me so that we could effectively interview Brian. I also knew that we couldn't just go in there with nothing in our hands. So some of the strategy was to, since we knew where Reagan was part of that, to go onto Google and print off photographs of the Street View area. Just so he wouldn't know where those photographs came from. He wouldn't know if it was surveillance video or what type of photographs we had. You keep talking about me killing somebody, man. Me shooting somebody as popular as hell. And you're, you're trying to get me to admit to something I didn't do. I, don't under, I, I honestly don't understand. Well, that. This, this, this is what's going to happen. So during the interview, Brian did admit to the kidnapping part of Reagan. He admitted to making Reagan drive him around to different locations and getting money out of an ATM. He also admitted to raping her during one of the cigarette breaks that we had. However, he would not admit to him being the one that shot her. He said that he had run into an old friend named TJ, and that TJ was the person that had actually pulled the trigger and killed Reagan. He said that once they got to the park, he's the one that exited the vehicle with Reagan, made her take all of her clothes off, and as she was walking away, TJ pulled the gun up and shot her back in the head, and then advanced on her again and shot her again on the side of the head. We at no time believed that a TJ existed. It was just a way for Brian to tell us the story by diverting the actual murder away from him and onto someone else. I think it became clear to him that the police had evidence. And so he had to sort of scramble and develop this fictional TJ that had committed the offense. Yeah. She walks out in the grass. Yes. That's kind of down the, down the hill. I said, stop. And he said, stop. And then I you, said, you balls out the rope. I said, don't move for 30 minutes. Why she said, all I want to do is live. I got you, I got you, I got you. It was very important throughout this interview process for us to find the murder weapon. After about an hour and a half of talking to him, specifically about the location of this weapon, he finally told me, all right, I'll tell you where the weapon's at if you can give me a couple hamburgers. As soon as Brian started eating one of the hamburgers, he said that he threw it in the storm sewer grate and gave me the location of where it was at. 
One of the other detectives that was interviewing Brian Goldsby had built a rapport with him. And when they left the interview room to go into another part of the police station to have a cigarette, something like that, uh, at that time, Brian Goldsby admitted that he had killed Reagan. I don't think he ever acknowledged there was no TJ in the interview with Detective Forney. He just walk until I tell you to stop. She walks, she's naked. She walks, he tells her to stop. He gets behind her. At first I heard a click, click, nothing happened. So I'm thinking the gun that he gave me was fake. Mm -hmm. And then he goes, pow! She falls. She's laying on the ground. I'm looking on the car. And down and shoots her again. Pow! During the interview, we realized that Brian had an ankle bracelet attached to his ankle from the conditions of his parole. At the time, we did not know that it was GPS enabled, that he was being tracked continuously. He's a registered tier three sex offender, which means he's committed sexual crimes in the past. We know that. He's got this GPS monitor on. It's tracking him, but they're not actively watching what he's doing, as I think a lot of people assume they would. What it revealed was at the moment that he kidnaps Reagan, the GPS also had a speed, the speed that he was walking or and or riding or driving a vehicle. And you can see where the speed went from two to three miles per hour of him walking to all of a sudden now he's going 25, 35, 40 miles an hour. GPS coordinates put him at every single place that Reagan had been. Everything was lining up with where his ankle monitor had gone. So Brian took a bus from his halfway house where he was staying at to this area. He got off the bus a couple blocks down the road, and he just started walking aimlessly around the city, just waiting to try to find someone to take advantage of. And when Reagan was walking down this street, that presented that situation for him. And this is where he intercepted her at, down here at her car. And we knew at that point that he was in Reagan's car. It matched up the timeline with Reagan leaving the bar. At one point, he had Reagan Tokes drive from her place of work, Bodega, throughout some of the downtown Columbus area. He had her stop at several ATMs. Reagan would have been terrified at this point, having a stranger in her car with a gun, not knowing what was going to happen, where she was going to go, and him just telling her to turn at different points during her drive. So one of Brian's goals for the night was to rob Reagan. So he forced her to drive to the first bank and withdraw some money. They were unsuccessful. Drove to another bank and tried another card. Again, they were unsuccessful. The car was stopped for a period of time in the German Village area, which is right on the outskirts of downtown Columbus. German Village is a nice part of town, but it also has this criminal element to it. And they parked in this location here, probably up against one of these buildings. So he forced her to remove her clothing. I'm sure Reagan was absolutely in shock and terrified and unable to do much because he had the, the gun pointed at her while he raped her. I think that was one of the hardest things for me to view that piece of evidence and that particular part of the GPS evidence because I could see how maybe she had some hope that he was gonna let her go. So once they leave this location and Brian has raped her, now they drive to back to the first bank, the Chase Bank, and go through the ATM, ATM machine again. And Reagan, Reagan is successful in withdrawing $60 from her account. The only other video that we had of Reagan and Brian was at the gas station where they put gas into Reagan's car. I think as we started to get all of those details, it just made you so angry to hear that how long she had been kidnapped for. It went on for hours. To think that she was marched out to a field and killed like an execution just 
you can't even comprehend what she must have been thinking other than what we do know her last words were was, I just want to live. And that's really all she wanted. She wanted to be able to come home and get to see her family again. And look, do you remember that? Oh, look at her little jacket. I know, with her little jacket on. And you still had your braces on there, but remember we sent that to Dad for Valentine's Day. That was the picture we took and we made what him a, a Valentine. <laughs> <laughs> Reagan was a very kind-hearted person. Her friends would always say that she had like a song for everything. So if she was making a bagel, she'd sing a song about the bagel she was gonna eat, or she just was constantly talking or having chatter or wanting to have a good time. It was unbelievable the amount of people that attended her funeral. And came to not only honor her, but to support us as well. Her funeral was held on Valentine's Day. My mom and I always said it, we were so sore after from so many hugs that we had given to people. I can remember at her funeral, a young lady talked to me about how she was a classmate of Reagan's and she was going through a terrible family situation at the time that she came to the school. And Reagan was the one person that was very kind and welcoming to her and invited her to sit with her at lunch and became her friend and introduced her to other people. And she literally ended up only being there for like a week because of what was going on in her family. She's like, but I went through, you know, the rest of my life saying Reagan Tokes was my friend. So that's the kind of person she was. It was a year before this actually went to trial. To sit in the same room with her killer was horrible. But I went into that trial resigned with the thought process that I knew justice would serve itself appropriately for Reagan and that we would accept the outcome. Brian Goldsby did stand up and apologize for what he had done uh, and admitted that there was no mysterious TJ. There was no other person that had committed the offense, but he still was very subdued. I think that was hard for some people to take as a genuine expression of remorse. It was a really long trial and my parents had gone to all of the days leading up to the final sentencing day and I had come in to attend the sentencing. There were times where we would leave the room when they were talking about something in great detail or showing any sort of images from the crime scene. Brian was very well coached in court. He would just sit there and do what his attorneys told him to do because he knew that the evidence that we had against him was pretty substantial and that he was looking at the death penalty. So he was trying to do everything that he could to avoid the death penalty. Brian Goldsby's defense team brought up his upbringing because we were seeking the death penalty. I don't know that I agree with all of it because there's a lot of people that face adversity in their childhood and do not end up committing offenses like Brian Goldsby did. But in this particular instance, I think it resonated with the jury. We were sent home and we were worried just that maybe it wouldn't finish up in that day. But we 